Okay, so there were a couple of things that I wanted to um, that I wanted to prove, but we ran out of time. Um, I have uh, gone to a different classroom to to record to record this portion. Um, okay, so um, let me just uh, remind you that uh, earlier um, in this lecture we proved this kind of um, statement about the Fourier series being the best, um, uh, the best approximation of your function in the L2 sense. So let me just um, recall that statement, right, that, um, that uh, um, you know, uh, if, you have, um, if you have some function that's uh, Riemann integrable um, and uh, Sn fx is the is the Fourier series the Fourier series for that um, um, uh, you know, the Fourier series of, of the, the partial partial sum of the Fourier series up, up to some particular degree um, for for that function right so these are the Fourier coefficients um, then we said two things. One was that um, uh, uh, if you looked at f minus s of n in the L2 sense, that was the smallest possible. Was the smallest was the smallest possible in the sense that if we took some other, if we replaced this uh, Fourier series by some other linear combination, then the difference would only get bigger. Okay. So if we replaced it by some other some other linear combination of those n terms, okay, it had to be of the same degree. Um, then that's going to be um, then the free the, the the error gets gets worse. Okay. Um, and then the second thing that we noticed was that um, that uh, the if we looked at the um, the L two norm of the partial sum. The L2 norm of the partial sums, um, then that was controlled by the L2 norm of the original function. Okay, so that was a that was a consequence that we observed after after we got this best uh, best approximation theorem. Okay, okay. so we're going to use that to prove um, something called the uh, the Reese Fisher the Reese Fisher theorem. Let me erase this stuff here. I feel like this board is smaller. Okay, I can write here. Okay, so here is um, what is apparently called the Reese Fisher theorem, although I've never called it this myself. Okay, so um, uh, here's a statement. You have some function that is uh, Riemann integrable and it's 2 pi periodic. Okay, um, then the limit of the limit as n goes to infinity of um, the L2 norm of the difference squared uh, is zero. Okay, so. So remember what we said. Uh, what we said earlier was that um, you know, you know, the this thing is the uh, the partial sum of the Fourier series is the convolution of f with the Dirichlet kernel, right? The Dirichlet kernel actually isn't a good kernel, and it's in fact possible to find even continuous functions for which uh, this thing uh, uh, doesn't converge back to, to the function at at some point. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, you maybe think that the the partial sums of the Fourier that the Fourier series doesn't really get get back your function, um, doesn't really return your function. But it turns out that if you're thinking in terms of L two, then you see what this says. This says um, basically that the um, if you look at the L two distance between uh, f and, and s of n, then that goes to zero. 
right? In other words, the S of n's, the partial sums of the Fourier series, form a sequence of points that converge to f in the, uh, with respect to the L2, uh, with respect to the L2, L2 norm, okay? So this is, a, this is kind of a redeeming, redeeming the, the Fourier series and saying that actually they do, they do recover your function. It's just not in the sense that, that we, were, we were originally thinking about. It doesn't recover it point-wise, but it recovers it in this L2 sense. Okay, so, um, okay. so uh, you know, notice that I could just as easily put, um, put this on it and, and translate it to say that we're trying to show that the limit of this uh, f minus Sn, Snf, that the L2 norm, that the limit of the L2 norm of the difference is zero. So that's, that's really what we're trying to show. Okay, so um, here is our proof. I'm gonna do it kind of in a funny way, uh, backwards of what I've got in my notes. So let's consider this thing here, right? Um, the L2 difference of F, F minus S of N F. And we're gonna specify N, what N is later. Okay, um, I'm gonna rewrite that. I'm gonna rewrite that as F minus H plus h minus f sub n, uh, I'm sorry, s of n h, um, plus s of n h minus s of n f. Okay. Now, you should be wondering what is, what is h and what is n? Okay. Um, it's an exercise to see that, um, that this, uh, actually does, that the L2 norm, the metric defined in this way, actually does satisfy a triangle inequality. So we can say that this is less than or equal to this plus this plus this. Right? As you expect. Okay, so now you're wondering, uh, what, what is this H? Okay, so, um, uh, um, there's a problem earlier on in the book that gives us the following fact. And the fact is that um, we can choose, uh, uh, it's possible because of our, because for, given any r that it's, uh, sorry, given any Riemann integrable function f that's 2 pi periodic, um, it's possible to create a, um, we can find a continuous 2 pi periodic function at h such that um, the L2 distance of f from h is less than, less than some epsilon. So, um, so let's say that we fix an epsilon over here. And we're going to try to find an n past which this is, past which this is smaller, than, smaller than epsilon. Okay, so we're trying to make each of these things smaller than epsilon over three. So probably I should take this to be epsilon over three here. Okay, so it's an exercise to see that um, given, given any, such, any such f, there's actually a continuous function that um, uh, in the L2, and L2 distance is, is less than epsilon three away from this guy. Okay. Um, okay, so that is going to give us control over this thing here, right? This is going to be epsilon over three. Um, now, uh, uh, now this thing here, um, recall our, our second fact from from uh, our, the conclusion, our, our conclusion from the best approximation uh, theorem that we had earlier, said that the um, the L two norm of the Fourier series. The L2 norm of the, of the Fourier series was actually smaller than the L2 norm of the original function, right? So that gives us this thing, right? Because here we're looking at the Fourier series of, right, this difference here, um, Sn h minus Snf in L2 norm is smaller than, um, I mean, that's equal to Sn h minus f, or when write it, f minus h. F minus h, right? That's what that is, right? 
and by the theorem that we just mentioned, um, that's smaller than the LT norm of f minus h, which is smaller than epsilon over 3. Right, so we know that this thing is smaller than epsilon over 3. Okay. And so the last thing, the only thing we have to worry about is, is this thing. You know, is these, uh, the, does the Fourier series of, of h, can we find an n such that the Fourier series of h is within epsilon of 3 over 3 of, of h itself? Okay, and for this we can use um, we're going to use uh, the um, the approximation that we the approximation theorem that we just that we just mentioned. So um, by the approximation theorem, we know that um, uh, there exists a trigonometric polynomial. There exists a trigonometric polynomial P such that the L2 distance between, um, between H and P is smaller than epsilon over 3. Right? There's a trigonometric polynomial P such that the L2 distance between H and P is less than epsilon over 3. Okay. We're trying to control this thing, right? Um, S minus the Fourier series of Fourier series of H, right? But um, remember, our best approximation theorem says that, um, that this is the best trigonometric polynomial, right? This SNH is the best trigonometric polynomial. If we're looking, um, so uh, uh, as long as N exceeds the degree of P, right? As long as N exceeds the degree of P, then this SNH is going to be a better approximate, uh, uh, approximator to, uh, to H than P was, right? So as long as that's true, we know that um, H minus SNH is smaller than uh, H minus P, which is smaller than epsilon over 3, right? So that gives us that this thing is smaller than epsilon over 3. We get this is going to be smaller than epsilon, right? So Given our epsilon, we 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 have found we have found that uh, as long as we're greater than the degree of the polynomial of the trigonometric polynomial that approximates the continuous approximation uh, of our Riemann integrable function, then we're good. <laughs> okay, so um, so that's the proof of the Ries Fisher theorem. Right? We found the we found the end that works. Okay, so the last thing I, last thing I want to show you guys is so-called Parse, Parseval's theorem, which is a consequence of the Ries, of the Ries Fisher, Fisher theorem. Um, and it says the following, that um, if you have a function, if you have two functions that are uh, Riemann integrable and 2 pi periodic, um, and their Fourier series are C sub n e to the in x, um, and uh, say gamma sub n e to the i in x. Then, when you take the inner product um, f against g, that is, you take the integral over your your interval negative pi pi of f against the complex conjugate of g. Then, what you get is actually the um, uh, the sum of the c sub n's times the um, times the uh, uh, complex, conjugates, uh, com complex conjugates of the gamma sevens. In other words, you get the inner product of the vector of, of Fourier coefficients of the first function against the Fourier coefficients of the second function. Um, and of course, as a consequence, um, you see that uh, if you're looking at the L2 norm of f, what you get is the little L2 norm, what you get is the magnitude of the vector, um, of the infinite vector of, of Fourier, Fourier coefficients. Okay, uh, that should be interpreted uh, the limit of, as n goes to infinity, as going from negative n to positive n, so expanding symmetrically. Okay, okay, so this turns out to be a consequence of the, of the Ries Fisher theorem. Um, so, here's the proof. You say, okay, well, let's consider, 
consider 1 over 2 pi times the integral from pi to pi, negative pi to pi, of Sn f g. Okay. So, um, right, we're, we're going to take some sort of limit. Um, you know, ultimately, we want to, 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 to look at this thing, but we'll, we'll get there uh, by taking the limit of, of what we get here. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> okay. so that is, by definition, right, um, 1 over 2 pi um, times negative pi to pi summation negative capital N to capital N uh, C sub C sub N e to the I N X G X D X. Right? And then we can pull out, we pull out the um, the sum, and uh, we also pull out the C sub N, and we're left with one over two pi um, oops, negative pi to pi um, G bar X e to the I N X D X. Okay. Okay. So um, I can. Uh, I'm going to do something funny, and I'm going to put. I'm going to take two conjugates. Okay. Taking two conjugates doesn't do anything. So I'm going to take the complex conjugate twice. So here's one of them, and then here's the other one of them, and that second one I'm going to slide into here. Okay. Because the complex conjugate of the integral is the integral of the complex conjugate. So here, you see what happens. G conjugate conjugate is just G. E I and X conjugate becomes E to the negative I and X. Okay. So what is this? You see that this is the Fourier, Fourier coefficient. This is the nth Fourier coefficient of G uh, conjugate. So that is summation negative N to N, C sub N, gamma sub N bar. Right? Because this thing is. This thing is gamma sub n. Okay. Okay. So um, let's see. Do I have enough space here? I think I do. Okay. So now um, we we want to show that uh, that this thing actually is this limit, right? That this thing actually is this limit. So um, now uh, so think. If we look at um, the integral of f minus g bar, f, f times g bar, um, minus the integral s n f g bar. Okay. Um, I can combine those things together. I can combine those things together. I get the integral from negative pi to pi, f minus s n f um, g bar. Which I'll use the triangle inequality here is smaller than the the integral of the of the absolute value. Okay. Now, by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, that's smaller than um, the integral from negative pi to pi of this thing, this thing uh, squared to the one half times um, the integral of size of g squared quantity is one half. Okay. But um, we just saw uh, uh, by the Reese Fisher theorem that this thing goes to zero. Right? This this quantity on the left goes to zero as n goes to infinity. And this is just a constant, right? That's just the, the L2 L2 norm of, of G, basically. Okay? So uh, what does that tell us? That tells us that in the limit, these things, uh, that this thing goes to zero, right? Um, right. In other words, that, um, that this thing equals the limit of that. Okay. So that's Parseval's theorem, and that gives you um, this kind of nice fact about the L2 norm of the function being expressible in terms of the, um, of the magnitude of the vector of, of, of Fourier coefficients. Okay, so that's that's it. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, uh, hope you guys have a nice summer, um, and I hope that uh, I hope uh, I showed you something cool about analysis. Okay, bye bye. <laughs>